We are here at the Rubin Museum of Art in the heart of Chelsea in New York City. And at the heart of our collection are works of art that are from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And uh, many of which are made by monks and artisans as a pure devotional act, an act of love, and are really symbols of love themselves. But of course, we can find love and experiences of love in many different artistic outlets. And I'm thinking, as, as we were preparing for tonight, I was thinking about um, the power of a song and even how the saddest, saddest song can make you feel good. And um, just that act of, uh, of connection and how powerful that is to be seen, to feel understood, and to know that we're not actually in isolation at all. So, um, of course, we're, we can see this act of love in the two artists that are here with us tonight. And um, we see that easily in Roseanne's work and um, also in the artistry of Sharon's teaching. She teaches here uh, regularly um, in our weekly mindfulness meditation uh, series. And I've really come to appreciate the artistry of her teaching. And I know I see many familiar faces. Anybody here who's been to that series, our, our weekly um, Lunchtime Wednesdays meditation series? Great. Um, so we'll turn it over to these, these two ladies whom um, maybe they don't know this, but we refer to them as our resident female Buddhas. They are both scribes, both creatives, and both um, really um, experts in this act of exchanging love, and, and perhaps in their personal lives, but really what a gift they give to the public when they do what they do, and that's a gift of love. Let's welcome them, Roseanne Cash and Sharon Salzberg. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Sharon. Hi. <laughs> Hello. You're kind of out there. <laughs> Good. I can sort of see you. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here with you, really. It's a Me tremendous too. honor. I plan on learning a lot. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's great. So. Um, we thought we'd begin with a really short meditation and hopefully have time for a slightly longer one as, as the evening gets on, but just to begin with more fully arriving and actually landing in this place in this time. So just for a few minutes, if you could settle your attention on the feeling of your breath, wherever you feel it most distinctly, and rest. In my early meditation practice, sometimes I would be so hypervigilant, I'd have to say to myself, you're breathing anyway. All you need to do is feel it. So it's kind of like that. Let's just feel it. You're breathing anyway. So oh, thank you. It always surprises me how even just a few moments can bring me so much more here. It's pretty great, actually. So love. <laughs> 
I feel like I've been, I've been dwelling in the neighborhood of love for so long, the effort, the time of writing the book, and now the birth of the book, and um, talking about the book. And, um, there were a couple of things that really came to mind when I was thinking about love and creativity. Um, well, a few things, actually. But um, one was something I had, I had told you that uh, working on this book reminded me in many ways of an earlier experience I had writing a book called Faith, where there were many times when I was really struggling and I couldn't see my way forward. And at one point... Uh, with Faith, I talked to this fabulous writer, Susan Griffin, who is both writing and coaching writing, and, and she said um, two things to me that were really amazing. She said, first of all, she said, you have to stop thinking of yourself as the, as the person writing this book and think of yourself as the first person who gets to read this book. Mm. And that was tremendous because I had so many, um, so much fear, I guess, about doing it justice. I wanted to do it right. And it was such a, a highfalutin topic and it was so magnificent and amazing. And I thought, I'm not going to hit it. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to really compromise. It's not going to be right. And, and then with her encouragement, I more or less let go of that. And I was just, the words would appear on the monitor and I'd be so excited. Oh, look, words. <laughs> I get to read it. <laughs> um, That's interesting that you experienced that same insecurity and I mean, that's definitive about of being a writer or an artist, those moments where you think, this is crap, and I, why am I doing this, yeah. and it'll never be as good as so-and-so's book or song or whatever. And then you push through, and suddenly a field appears before yeah. you that you, yeah. you can get to. Yeah. But your book, I had this, I told you uh, earlier that it was working on several levels with me. It was reading the words and doing um, the practices that you um, prescribe, but I felt the oddest sense that the book was meditating me. That makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was working at a really subtle level, yeah, and I know yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, it was yeah. like it's seeping into your DNA and awakening something that I probably already knew. I'm sure you definitely already knew it. <laughs> well, but not in the way you know it. That's, what was, that's what's fascinating to me. Some of the things you talk about, I know in my work, but I don't know in relationships. It was mm -hmm. interesting to see how it's all the same. Like we talked yeah. about the inner critic. Yeah, yeah. That the, ferocious inner critic. That ferocious inner critic. And the way you wrote about it is exactly, almost identical words of what I would say to my songwriting students. Like that the inner critic can dismantle you and it'll, uh, you've got to get it out and objectify mm -hmm. it, get it outside of your body yeah. to see what yeah. it is. But then I, I tell them something which is to bring it back later on to edit. Yeah, that, I had never considered that. The, uh, worth, the relative worthiness of the voice of my inner critic, which as many of you know, I named Lucy. Uh, I really apologize to any Lucy's in the room or online, anywhere in the world, actually. Uh, every Lucy that exists. Uh, it's Lucy after uh, the character in the Peanuts comic strip. Having once seen a cartoon where Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown and says, oh, you know, Charlie Brown, what your problem is, the problem with you is that you're you. And then uh, poor Charlie Brown says, what in the world can I do about that? And then Lucy says, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. <laughs> and uh, I saw the cartoon. A friend of ours had rented a house for many of us to do a retreat in, and it had been left in the room, <laughs> designated for me. And uh, <laughs> uh, whenever I walked by that desk, and I, I, my eye would fall on that line, the problem with you is that you're you. And because that Lucy voice had been so dominant in my earlier life, and so uh, I named my inner critic Lucy, and I sort of mapped my understanding of mindfulness and my progress with mindfulness with how I related to her. Mm. Um, and so what I came to, actually, it was very soon after I saw the cartoon, something great happened for me. And my very first thought was, it's never going to happen again. <laughs> and I responded with, hi, Lucy, <laughs> and followed by, chill out, Lucy which I considered really kind of a triumph in a way, because it was yeah. so different than, you're right, Lucy, you're always right. 
And it was so different than, oh my God, Lucy's here, what a disgrace, I'm so ashamed, I can't believe she's still here. And, but I'd never considered, I was always trying to be nice to her, you know, and yeah. kind of cordial without letting her take over. But I never actually thought about sitting down with her and saying, okay, now everyone's calmer. Well, <laughs> Tell I, me. I did something similar a long time ago. I, I, I painted, and I painted my inner critic, and there were these evil little creatures. There were about 10 of them, and I called them the committee, and I actually made a T-shirt of the committee so I could really get them out. But I realized that they want a job, and that if you bring them as a writer, if you bring it back at the end of the process to help you edit, then they're happy. They have a job. That's fantastic. <laughs> I guess I have to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's a similar story about the problem with you is you. Um, the musician, jazz musician, Charlie Parker, one of the greatest musicians, he was a heroin addict and he um, was going off to Paris on a trip and to get away and his friend said to him, you know who will be waiting when you get off the plane? You. It's like you can't get away. Yeah. yeah. You got to take yourself with you. Yeah. Always. You always find yourself wherever you go. It's like, <laughs> oh, you again. <laughs> oh, you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny when you said that, though, about understanding, because I ended up, um, you know, I learned so much from this woman, Susan, when I was trying to write Faith, and I ended up putting a huge, giant quote of hers in the middle of the book. And then, um, uh, quite a number of years later, I ended up on the phone with her because we were, um, I had met this Tibetan nun who'd been a freedom fighter and escaped and uh, had became a nun. And, um, and we were trying to find somebody to write the story of her life. So mm -hmm. I was on the phone with Susan and she said, I was reading your book and um, it was really uh, amazing and it was like, I realized, I don't understand this, and I don't know this, and I don't, I don't see things this way. What a revelation. And then I turned the page, and there was a whole huge long quote from me. <laughs> and I said, see? You do understand. I learned it from you. I read what you wrote, and I went, oh, right. That's the perfect way of saying it. So I think we all actually probably do know, and we forget. You know, I, something you said in the book, too, about um, this is kind of a segue, it's tangential in a way. But anyway, about three people in a relationship, you, me, and the space between us, that is so, such a beautiful concept that yeah. it's inspired me to write about it myself. But I started thinking about that in terms of music, that if the space, you, me, and the, spa and the space is actually music, what that does to a relationship, because I'm married to my collaborator, yeah. and we work together a lot. Um, and I think I told you, I don't think we would still be together if we didn't perform together because of the healing power of music. Mm -hmm. and, but also because you see the essence of someone when they're performing and what they give to an audience and how exquisitely beautiful that is and vulnerable and how could you hold on to petty things um, when you see the essence of someone. And I was talking to... Diana Krall about this because she's married to Elvis Costello and I don't know very many couples who do the same thing like that and she's saying it's identical for me. She said I can absolutely hate him that day and then he gets on stage and I see who he is and your heart melts. But I wanted to ask you about the space, if it's not music, what it, else it could be <laughs> that would enhance the two people uh, uh -huh. yeah. you, me, and the space. Right. Well, I think it's authenticity because well, I, I had this go. image, as you were saying it, of um, you know, somebody getting up on the stage in another way. You know, like I don't play music with people. I often team teach with people or uh, involved in different collaborations. And uh, even as you said, get up on the stage, I had an image of uh, years and years ago, when I first went to India, which was, I went in 1970, and I was still uh, wandering around looking for a teacher and looking for a practice, and, um, and it was still 1970, it was right toward the end of the year, I went to a, a yoga conference, an international yoga conference in New Delhi, 
uh, which was a really dismal affair, and the low point of which was the yogis and swamis up on the stage pushing and shoving against each other to be the first to grab the mic and speak. <laughs> <laughs> and it was by the sheerest of coincidences that actually Dan Goleman, who was at the time a psychology student studying meditation, happened to be delivering a paper at that conference. And he mentioned he was on his way to an intensive 10-day meditation course. I thought, that's it. And it was it. Uh, but that image, obviously, people don't always do that blatantly, but there's, there could be a lot of that going on, you know, up on the stage. Um, there's artifice, or there's uh, that extra thing of, you know... Uh, so it's beautiful. What you're talking about is, is the most open, authentic... Well, that's... Right, and my, my idea and understanding of performing has changed over the 38 years I've been doing it. In the beginning, I thought it was um, a way to get judged, yeah. that you went on the stage to be judged, and that perfection was part of what you were attempting. So many things you talk about in your book, not mm -hmm. about performance and music, but it kept, the light bulb kept going off. And over time, I've come to realize it's not about that at all, it's about energy exchange. Yeah. And it's about um, feelings, you know. I mean, Bob Dylan said people, an audience doesn't come to feel my feelings, they come to feel their own feelings. To, yeah. They want you to open it up for them so that they can feel it. So that to me is love. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes during concert, as people do in an audience, someone will yell out, I love you, we love you. And Sharon, my first thought, I realized reading your book that my first thought whenever someone says that is, you don't really know me. And that's kind of sad. Yeah. But then I always say, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't well, that that's funny? the space in between. There you go. That is the space in between. Right, you don't know me, but I love you too. And yeah. this is what we're all working towards, yeah. right? No, it's true. I mean, in the beginning of my teaching career, um, I, I was terrified of public speaking. I could never, you, you ever, 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 ever yeah. give a talk. And the um, construct, the, the uh, schedule of our retreats is that you practice in different ways all day with some teacher contact or maybe questions and answers. And there's one formal lecture every night. So the first retreat I actually taught in this country was with my colleague, Joseph Goldstein. It was 30 days, and he had to give every talk. Because wow. I couldn't, I was petrified, I couldn't do it. I thought, my big fear was that my mind would go blank right. and I would just sit there <laughs> and be completely humiliated and I could not do it. And people kept coming up to him, yelling at him, saying, why won't you let her have a voice? Why won't you let her speak? <laughs> and he kept saying, I'd love a night off. Just like, talk to her, you know, couldn't do it. And then probably a year or more went by and I thought, you know, there is this one topic, loving kindness, where there's a, a guided meditation you can do. So if my mind goes blank, I can launch into the guided meditation. Mm. Maybe nobody will notice. So at home in Massachusetts, I have piles and piles and piles of cassette tapes because I can only give one talk on loving kindness. It was all the same talk. And then a long, long time went, late, went by and I thought, you know what? It's all about loving kindness. It's all about connection. Mm. That's why we're in this room together. That's right. It's not about my expertise in something. It's just about connection. And that was the moment I could begin to give talks. I've learned that myself in performing. You know, like I used to have dreams about forgetting lyrics or something. Every time I've forgotten a lyric, I mean, that's the moment the audience loves the most. Yeah, it's true. Your, your humanity is revealed and they feel connected to that. Yeah. They don't want perfection. Perfection is the enemy of good. Is that yeah, the it's saying? True. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's really true. And I, I told Pema Chodron that, that I was so afraid of. Wait, you told Pema Chodron something? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> we were having lunch together. <laughs> we were having lunch together, and I said... I love that. I, I was always... <laughs> I was always Me and Pema were sitting around, and... <laughs> no, go ahead. Yes, it's not Sorry. Sorry. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's, it's like... It gives me a little thrill. <laughs> it was thrilling for me, too. I said I was always terrified of speaking because I was afraid my mind would go blank. And she said, I was always terrified of speaking because I was afraid I was going to like just detour into some topic that was completely tangential. And she said, in all these years of doing that, no one's complained. 
<laughs> no one's come up and said, you know, you started out talking about that, and you ended up talking about that. How could you? It's like, here we are together. You know, you know there was something else I wanted to ask you about. Um, this also, uh, seen through the lens of a performer and an artist, this whole concept of self-love, it makes me a little nervous mm -hmm. after a certain point because mm -hmm. where do you, where's the line between self-love and self-indulgence, self-absorption, self, um, well, to the exclusion of service, to the exclusion of other people's feelings or... Um, like I have a friend who whenever there's any hint of conflict, she'll say, I must take care of myself, and she slams the door on you and there's no more conversation. She thinks that that's self-love, and to me that that's, it's hurtful and mm -hmm. you know, dismissive and mm -hmm. disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, and a lot of, okay, so here's, here's a more specifically a question. So I, I teach songwriting quite often and go into schools and I run into this phenomenon regularly, which is a young songwriter who thinks that he doesn't need to know the tradition he's writing in <clears throat> or any songwriters who came before him or uh, what a rhyme scheme means or the mechanics of <clears throat> you know, uh, melody or verse chorus structures or any of the mechanics, any of that, because his expression is enough. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's completely self-indulgent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But some would say, well, that's valid, you know, his yes. expression. I said, well, that's what toddlers do. That's, you know, art requires discipline. Explain, Sharon. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you here, too. Oh, good. <laughs> There's a, a, a time monk who used to say, it's not a question of following your heart. It's a question of training your heart. Oh, I love yeah. that. Um, I think about it largely, I think, in terms of balance. You know, like, for many of us, with, with Lucy, the strongest thing going, and, uh, you know, that tremendous kind of um, sense of blame and failure, the balance is actually moving away from that and having some kindness towards yourself and being able to begin again. It's like resilience training, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I blew it, I made a mistake, let me start over, you know, rather than collapse or just blame myself for the next 15 years, you know? Right, like, right. And so that's a lot of what that kind of conversation is about. You know, let's move away from that. And there can definitely be a place where, um, you know, it, it just becomes, uh, it's like a parody or satire almost of itself, you know, like I'm being nice to myself, so I'm therefore. Yeah. Well, go back for a second about, um... Something you said made me think about maternal guilt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have five children, mm. and so I have maternal guilt in spades. <laughs> because, um, you know, the worst thing in the world is to see your child suffer. Yeah. And even worse than that is to know or think that you caused any yeah. suffering. Yeah. And to be aware of something later on that you realize that child didn't need that at all. I shouldn't have done that if I'd only done that. So you do talk about this in the book, too, mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. loving yourself through regret mm -hmm, and guilt. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah. Um, in, uh, and well, in the Buddhist psychology, there's actually a, uh, with this kind of an excruciating you know, exactitude about words, um, there's a difference between remorse and guilt, remorse being the kind of genuine pain of right. seeing, you know, I blew it or could have done better or I really broke the fabric of some trust or whatever it was and, and lessons learned, you know, I want to move on. I want to move on with determination to see more clearly. And whereas guilt is, is, not, is not having the ability to move on. It's being stuck. Like I am a terrible parent. I was have been, I was will be. It's never going to change. I'm only that. I've never done anything good for my children. This is the only thing I've ever done, you know, and it's really being frozen in time, which is in a way, that's what trauma is also. It's like yeah. freezing, uh, being stuck in that way. And so... How do you um, break the stuckness, though? Well, some of it is actually under, it's wisdom, it's understanding that, you know what, uh, this isn't serving. This is an old habit. Hi, Lucy. You know, like, right. have a cup of tea, just relax. Uh, I'm going to see what I might do, you know, in terms of making amends or lessons learned and move into that kind of more positive 
direction. There's also a certain sense of, um, I've at times taught with his friend Mark Epstein, who's a psychiatrist here in town and, and has written many books on Buddhism and psychotherapy. And uh, his, his favorite, um, his mentor in a way, on a doubt they ever met, but uh, it was D.W. Winnicott, who's a psychoanalyst in Britain. And um, he's always quoting him. And, and one of his, his quotations is, uh, just be a good enough mother. Just be good enough. And people protest in terms of gender. And he says, well, you know, he was in Britain, and the only people bringing their kids were the mothers. So that's what he said. But it means be a good enough parent. Since someone in the room always says, well, what does it mean to be a good enough mother? And Mark says, it means surviving your child's rage. And then, and then someone says, what does it mean to survive your child's rage? And Mark says, um, it means don't be too invasive and don't be withdrawn. Like hang in there with the yeah. feeling, you know, be yeah. fully present with what is. And then I always say, that's what we call mindfulness. That's exactly what we do with ourselves. And so how would, um, I mean, you also talk about how our earliest relationships hardwire our understanding mm -hmm. of future relationships. Mm -hmm. And so how do you break that chain? Uh, through mindfulness as well? Yes, everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's the intentionality, actually, right. um, in that. Um, I mean, your own suffering, you talk yeah, about that, yeah, your, yeah. your own childhood and how you. Yeah. Yeah. Brought love into that. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember if this is in the book or not. I always have a hard time writing it because it's very visual memory. But um, I, was on this <laughs> I was on the stage once with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Was Pema there as well? <laughs> no. <laughs> she wasn't. But I was on the stage once with the Dalai Lama. And Matthew Ricard is a French. I was on the stage with Bob Dylan. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know. <laughs> Elvis Costello. <laughs> you know, Diana Crawford. <laughs> the meeting of worlds. Um, so anyway, I was on the stage with I love this. the Dalai Lama and uh, Richard Davidson, who's a neuroscientist in Wisconsin, studying meditation. And um, Barbara Fredrickson, who's a researcher studying meditation in North Carolina, and a few other people. And... Uh, Barbara and Richie got into this thing with the Dalai Lama about uh, good parenting, you know, and coming from a warm, nurturing, affectionate home. And, and the Dalai Lama started talking about his mother, who he always says was his greatest teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, she taught me compassion. She taught me everything. And, and I could feel the room, the mood in the room was going down. You know, because it's all about how hard it is if you didn't have that. To, oh, right. You know, I mean, even the term hardwired, it's so harsh, you know. And, right. And, uh, you know, and I could feel everyone's getting as depressed as I feel right now. And so I raised my hand and I said, well, you know, I, I'm sure that's true, but like I didn't have that kind of childhood. And this is why it's so visual. Both the Dalai Lama and his translator, their mouths went, oh. <laughs> And I never knew how to write that. Like, oh, <laughs> they look so sad. <laughs> and then I said, but what I had was a strong intention. I wanted to be better. Yeah. I wanted to make a right. different kind of life. And out of that intention, I found it's kind of the sources of that love and ways to love. And you know, I found it without that. And, and I found everyone so happy in the room. <laughs> okay. That's a really ephemeral and kind of inexplicable thing though because I had that too I had a tough childhood too my father was a drug addict and my mother was enraged about it and very distracted and um, and I was very resilient I created imaginary um, adults who were safe yeah. and and I was an artist and I knew it early on and I knew that that could save me. Art and music could save me, and it has many times. Mm -hmm. But I have siblings who didn't have that, yeah. and who, even though are alive, some have not survived our yeah. childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and sometimes I have survivor's guilt over that. And I just wonder what is it in certain people that you can survive and that you're longing for 
love and art and healing is so great yeah. that yeah. it will carry you through terrible trauma. Yeah. And other people who give up right away. Yeah. Who don't have the the longing, which I actually think longing is a wonderful thing to keep yeah, your yeah. whole life. Yeah, yeah. Not to get rid of it with anything, with love, yeah. even yeah, yeah. love. But what is that yeah. in some people that other people don't have and why it's so sad. Yeah. It's it is very sad. But I would say, you know, even if someone doesn't have it throughout much of their life, I wouldn't give up on them, you know, and the right. possibility of that turning around, I just wouldn't. And, mm -hmm. But of course, clearly it's true. I, I think for me, it wasn't even so much the longing, although I actually agree with you that that kind of longing channels us through yeah. everything, but there was some kind of knowing. Mm -hmm. Like I look back, you know, I left for college when I was 16, I left for India when I was 18. Um, I had done an Asian philosophy course. There was a, the possibility of going to India or going anywhere in the world through an independent study program. I created a project that I want to go to India and learn how to meditate. And they accepted it and I got on an airplane. I'd never even been to California. Wow. You know, like, um, and I think, how did I know? You know, there was something in me that just knew. There's something else, there's something there for me. Right. There's something in that system, that way of thinking. There's something I, that will, will be there for me, something truthful for me. I mean, I, could have, I was in college in Buffalo. I could have stayed there, I suppose, and, uh, you know, studied. I could have studied Buddhism. I could have gotten a doctorate. I could have, you know, done whatever. But I got on that airplane at the age of 18. And I think something in us does know. So was, along with the yearning, yeah. there's a confidence or... Yeah, and that mystery of why do you know, how do you know, I mean, that in that mystery is a lot of art and yeah. music, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. We say I never think of myself as an artist, except when I'm introduced as one, <laughs> so, <laughs> which I always like, so thank you. And, and then I think, oh, I write. Actually, I write. So that's, that's art. You know, um, when Dawn was speaking earlier, I was thinking, she said something that made me think about... Um, the love in music. I remember uh, right after 9-11, you know, those few months after 9-11 were so tough here and we lived downtown and um, my kids were downtown at school and it was so traumatic and awful. And then you remember the plane crash that happened in December. So it was, it was like this series of events if you were in New York that was just mm -hmm. horrifying. And I was stoic and I had little kids and you know, I was just plowed through. And then the, was sitting in the kitchen listening to the radio at Christmas, the British proms, and they played uh, Barber's Adagio for Strings, which is, I think, the saddest piece of music ever written. And those three months just came flooding out of me. Just, I cried to the depths mm. of my mm. being and that piece of music, it healed me from yeah. the yeah. experience. It truly yeah. did. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with my husband. You know, sometimes I just hate him when I walk on stage. And I'm so annoyed with him, and we've been in a fight. And I see him and hear him play and see his essence, and it heals you. It's remarkable, because a lot of times when I can't relate to people, I can relate to art and music. Yeah, yeah. A great painting great piece of literature. Do you turn to, to that yourself? I do in, in certain ways. I, mean, I think that um, in like Asian tradition or Buddhist tradition, the thing that makes a, a work great is the transformation of the artist in the process of creating it. Yeah. So I'm sure you intuit that when you, when you are looking at something or reading something or or listening sure. to something, and, and I think that I do as well. You know, like I love being upstairs here, you know, and just right. looking at something and thinking, you know, feeling like, oh, this, maybe this took 20 years right. to create this one piece. And, but they broke through into yeah. something. They touched a mystery. Yeah, yeah. That's what um, the most beautiful thing for me is, is to feel that they did touch it, you know? Yeah. And it often brings up more questions than any answers. Yeah, which is great. And which it's interesting best. as a writer, you know, because 
Maybe, can I do a book of questions next? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's uh, another thing this woman, Susan Griffin, said to me way back when I was working on faith. She said, a lot of people think you would write a book about a topic like that because you're an expert and you want to impart your expertise. But more likely, you're writing about a topic like that because that's part of the work. Yes. You know, the writing itself is part of the attempt to be in that immerse it and understand it. Well, and personally, didn't you probably wanted to know more about it, yeah, too. And yeah, the way yeah. to find out more is write it. I mean, I, right. when I was writing my memoir, um, it was startling to me how many boxes I unpacked about my own life and was able to organize my thoughts around it. That's why that happened. That's the motivation of that person. Yeah. That's why I left that person. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's why yeah. I cut that tie. That thread still exists. That one I had to cut. Yeah, yeah. I found out so much, you know? I mean, and ultimately, yeah. like you said, you're the first person to read the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wrote it for myself. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. And that's what, I think that when I said authenticity, and there are a lot of ways of playing a piece of music, and a lot of ways of writing a piece, you know? There's certainly ways of writing a piece where you are attempting to impart your expertise, and that's very different right. than that bearing of the soul and, and that really being there. Right. I think people um, don't care as much about expertise as they do about humanity yeah. and yeah. vulnerability. Yeah. That takes a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> you don't I can't to, write, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to fear uh, being wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. What's your next book going to be? Uh -huh. <laughs> you just got this one out, right? Um, your publisher is sitting there going. It's sitting right there. <laughs> uh, well, uh, somebody sent me some notes. She said, I, want, I think you should write a book about home because everybody really wants a sense of home. They want a sense of belonging. And I, as I've said on this stage actually in the past, I have a great, great, great thing about the Statue of Liberty. I love the Statue of Liberty, and it, she thrills me, and, and the symbol of it, and I'm very devoted to her. And I've even got a few little green, you know, things, erasers and stuff. Uh, and I once contemplated getting like a six-foot Statue <laughs> of Liberty, but I didn't do it. I love her. And uh, so, uh, and somebody told me they were going to see you tomorrow, actually, yeah. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well, that's what she symbolizes for me, like, welcome home. And I just, as you did, just came back into the country. Uh, I came from England, and I was feeling kind of sad because um, it's all done by machine now. Yeah. And there used to be somebody, even though if they grilled you and it felt a little odd, like, what do you do for a living? I teach meditation. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they would end with saying, welcome home. And I realized I really missed somebody saying, welcome home at customs and immigration. Yeah, mm. it, was, uh, it was different, you know, so, yeah. but I don't know. I, I mean, this book. Do you always, here. do you find yourself feeling like a beginner every time you start a new project? Yeah. I always feel that as well. And I, I love that because I think the air gets taken out of everything if you feel mm -hmm. like um, there's nothing new and you know exactly yeah. what you're doing. But, you know, it's always a little thrill going into the studio or walking on stage or starting a new song, like, how do I do this again? Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. some sense of mastery takes over, but the thrill remains if you yeah. feel like a beginner. Yeah. But I mean, that's very Buddhist too, isn't it? Too? It's extremely Buddhist. Yeah. The Dalai Lama, even if he were sitting here, would, would be nodding his head. <laughs> he would. That's really good. <laughs> that's really good. And, but yet, I also I agreed with you very much about the, the craft of something or the discipline yeah. of something. And uh, I keep thinking, you know, I won't sign another contract. I'll learn how to write. <laughs> like, I'll study, you know, I'll learn the, the history and, you know, just kind of the, um, the form and the structure and, and things like that. I think it would be. There's a beautiful um, balance between mastery and being a student, you know. Yeah. And going back and forth in that is, is so satisfying to me. Like, when one fails, you can fall over into the other. Right. Right. And I, I just can't even imagine, you know, uh, maybe I'll write in another form. I don't know. What yeah, we'll write in, in uh, 
iambic pentameter or something. <laughs> Um, uh, before we get to questions, yeah. I, I got to ask you this: Why do people marry their opposites? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an expert in anything. <laughs> no, I find that. I mean, I certainly did. I married my polar opposite, and in the beginning, you think this is so great; he's so different. And then after a year, you think, why is he not like me? <laughs> but you said that your partner is your greatest teacher. Yeah, I mean, I, I would book. think that we, I think there could be different reasons. You know, one reason which would not be maybe the healthiest reason is that we will think we will find everything we are lacking in and someone else. And then, and then we get too attached or dependent and then it, it doesn't, it has to shift. It, it can't really stay that way. Um, but I imagine it could be, it's a little bit exotic. You know, it's yeah, different. It's exotic. But you did say, I mean, I just read this in the book about that other person will never fill in those yeah, holes, will yeah. never make you whole. Yeah. And that's the fallacy. An entire pop music industry is built on that fallacy, by the way. <laughs> I know, I tried. I wanted, I asked people be, in the process of writing the book to send me stories and their favorite pop lyrics and things like that. And I didn't get that many pop lyrics, but. I was thinking about yeah, that. Just... You, you told me that you were asking that question and I thought, well, the most real pop lyric would be foreigners, I wanna know what love is, Yeah. right? Yeah. All of the other stuff about hookups and breakups and heart, but yeah, okay, that's kind of busy work. But the real question is, I wanna oh, know what, what love, love is. is. Yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm I, waiting for the answer. <laughs> the whys are kind of hard, right? The why questions, yeah. you know, like, um, what is love? I just say connection, you know, yeah. like, let's strip it away from all those expectations and the, uh, the undue pressure. And, and you also said it's being seen. Yeah, yeah. I had a dream one night. I was... Um, in Barry, Massachusetts, where the Insight Meditation Society, which I co-founded, is this retreat center. And I was actually teaching a retreat there. Uh, and I was asleep at night, and I dreamt that I was teaching a retreat there. And uh, <laughs> someone came in to see me in the dream and said, why do we love people? And in the dream, I said, because they see us. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up. And I thought that was really good. <laughs> that was really good. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yeah, really? You know, like, wow. And I think that is true. It's they so see us. true. And like what you see in your husband when he's playing is something so essential, as you said, yeah. you know, that may not manifest. I don't know if it does or not. It may not manifest in the grocery store, you know, or It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so. But there it is. But there know. it is. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. It's his soul. Yeah. 